dealt with two views, and so far I disagree with both of those. Let's come to a third view. Others have seen a somewhat mystical notion being expressed. Now, <laughs> turn on your mystic antennas now to catch all of this. This is the mystical view of this passage. Although it's, it, it can be seen maybe from some other verses, but it's kind of stretching it mystically for me here. Others have seen a somewhat mystical notion being expressed. For instance, the margin of the New American Bible, the Catholic version, is where you'll find this view in a marginal reference. And you may find it other places as well. I know that's one place that I came across it. Well, all I can do is read, and then I'll, I'll try to give you the points as we go along. They aver that the word this is being emphasized. I go not up unto this feast. For it is interesting that Jesus did not say the feast. Now, we would e expect him to say, I'm not going up to the feast. We don't, we don't try to specify the these by calling them a this. We just say, I'm not going to the game. I'm not going to the job. I don't say I'm not going to this game or this job when that game or that job is the only one under consideration. You only say this when you're specifying out of a category of 14 things and you say, this is the one I want. If there's only one there, you just say, the, 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 that's the one that I want. So they have pointed out that it's interesting he uses the word this. I am not going up to this feast rather than the word thee. So there's one point of theirs. This and not to thee. The true meaning relates to the next feast. So it's a contrast to feast. When you use this, it's a contrast between something else in that group. If you're saying I, I go not up to this feast, then the implication might be because I'm going up to that feast another feast the true meaning relates to the next feast that Jesus would attend the Passover of his crucifixion and the thought of that the Passover his of his crucifixion in Jesus mind dictates the meaning of these present words in John 7 8 now this is a possibility let me go over that sentence again that was pretty much their view in a nutshell and it is a possibility. The true meaning relates to the next feast. Whenever he said, I'm not going up to this feast, it's a contrast of tabernacles and Passover. And the thought of Passover in Jesus' mind dictates the meaning of these words in John 7, 8. I'll have to give you one more statistic before we'll have it all so I can say what they're trying to say. So, in other words, as Jesus is talking, when he says, I go not up to this feast, what, what's in the back of his mind, what's in the front of his mind, I guess they would argue, is the next feast, the Passover of his crucifixion. He's contrasting these feasts. I go not up at this one. I go up at that one. You say, but still he went up at this one. Well, let's go to the went up or go up figure then. Go up is a figure of speech for crucifixion according to the proponents of this view. Go up, in quotation marks, go up, is a figure of speech for crucifixion, according to the proponents of this view. And they have biblical support for this, I might add, here in this gospel, two other places. John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Remember that verse? And what's he predicting there? Well, John tells us in the next verse, he spoke of the manner of his death, crucifixion. And I, if I be lifted up, you can get dual meanings out of that, exalted in people's praise and life and their service to him, and that's probably implied there. But there's a more literal historical meaning. And if I be lifted up, literally he was lifted up on a cross. If I be lifted up from the earth, then I will draw all men unto me. So they would say lift up or, or go up is a figure of speech for crucifixion. 
Therefore, pretty much we would have their answer, their, their meaning here. As I go not up at this feast, I'm not going to be crucified at this feast. And so whether I go to this or not go to it, it's really not important because I go not up. I'm not going to be crucified at this feast. I'm going to be crucified at the next feast, which is Passover, the crucifixion time. And I have a note here. Let's see the margin of the New American Bible. They are proponents of this view, the New American Bible. Not New American Standard now, the Catholic New American Bible. Now, that's pretty much their argument, but they have some more points. Let's go on here. I find this an intriguing view here. I go not up. We don't need the yet then as implication or text. He's telling his brothers, is, I'm not going to be glorified now by crucifixion. And when he said this feast, I go not up at this feast, I'll be going up at the next one. And he could then go literally with his two legs and feet to this feast and still not contradict himself because the going to is not the same as the going to that he had reference to symbolically here in verse 8. Furthermore, it is argued that the last phrase in verse 8, my time has not yet come. My time is not yet full come. The last phrase of verse 8 also speaks of the cross. They would argue, for when Christ uses the words time or hour, he always has reference to his death. Now, do you remember phrases in John when he said that my hour is not yet, my time is not yet come? Many times those refer to crucifixion. My hour is not yet come. My time is not yet full come. The right time is not yet. Many times that does refer to crucifixion. Now, remember how we studied Musterion and Paul's theology? This not yet right time, the right time business, is, is one of these things you'd study in John's gospel. He's always saying either time or hour. My time, my hour has not yet come. What does John mean by that? Well, it's difficult to know what he means by that. But I can say this, it does not appear to be the case that when he uses that on the lips of Jesus, or either he uses it himself, that he always has reference to the same thing. In other words, his employment of those phrases, time and hour, do not seem to be uniform. Most of the time, they do seem to refer to the cross when he says that my hour has not yet come. He's talking about his glorification in crucifixion. But I think there are some exceptions to that. Um, if you'll look with me in John 2, and I think this is one of those exceptions. John 2 and verse 4. John 2, 4. I don't think, now I have not researched this thoroughly, but I don't think that you can press this of my time or my hour has not yet come to mean crucifixion. Here they have the wedding in the city of Cana, the area of Galilee, and Jesus' mother is there and his disciples, and the wine is evaporated. Well, not evaporated. Too many people were drinking too much. And Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. Now, she's asking for some miracles to be done here, or a miracle to be done, obviously. And his response says, My time has not yet come. Well, if that means crucifixion, then that would mean I won't work any miracles until I'm crucified because my time has not yet come to start working miracles. Well, that wouldn't make any sense. You're not going to be working any miracles while you're on the cross. The miracle is that you're there, that you're God and that you're there. So he has some other type of reference, such as the initiation of his ministry, approved of God of miracles. My time has not yet come. And so what he does here in, in chapter 2 is probably just a prelude, in his understanding anyway, to the full-flown glory of the miracles of his ministry. He says, my time is not yet come. What, what time is he talking about? Crucifixion? Is John's time and hour always in reference to Christ's crucifixion? I don't think so. I think many times it is, and sometimes it's not. John 2, 4 being one of the latter. 
And what about John 7, 8? Well, that's one of the difficult ones then. I see how it could go either way. So I think I'll be safe tonight by not even answering which way I think <laughs> that John 7, 8 goes because as long as we have proven from John 2, 4 that crucifixion is not uniformly the understanding of our or, not, or time in John's gospel, then it destroys the theory. As long as you can find one exception, then you can't prove everything on this case because it's not uniform. Here, the phrase in verses 6, notice that you've got it back there in 6 as well. In 6 as well as 8b, refer at least in part to his going up to the Feast of Tabernacles. And then maybe it does have further later cryptic reference to the crucifixion. Here it may just have reference to tabernacles, although there, John may intend for us to also see in its literal historical reference to tabernacles a few, day, a few days hence from this time to also have read the other portions of his gospel where the hour or the time being not yet fully come having a reference to the crucifixion. So we've got three, three views, in other words, assuming that, that Uk is genuine in the text. We have, well, let's substitute yet for implication. Let's say that, secondly, he changed his mind later on. Let's say, thirdly, according to this mystical view, that what he's really talking about is crucifixion. I'm not going to be crucified at this feast. I will the next one. And therefore, he involves himself in no contradiction between his words and his actions bottom of page 35 as Calvin was so prone to say away with such sophistry for the answer appears to be more straightforward although it comes with no small degree of difficulty here are my points sent number one I'm coming to what I think is the answer here as far as there being a contradiction in Jesus life i.e. he lied It must be kept in mind that the present tense in Greek is more emphatically present than in English. It must be borne or kept in mind that the present tense in Greek is more emphatically present than in English. Thus he was not presently going at the time at which he spoke. We don't really have to assume the word yet. All we have to know is what the Greek is. It's present tense, and present is more emphatically present. I am not going. There's really not an implication of yet. It's just this time right now, at this moment, I am not going. He waited until three or four days later. Now, the feast is a seven-day feast, remember or no if you didn't know, so now you can remember. He waited until three or four days later. That is, until the middle of the feast. Verse 14, we haven't read this far, have we? Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. In other words, I think there are some very important things in John's chronology of Christ's itinerary regarding the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, notice we have his brothers asking him to go up. Now, that must have been a few days or so in preparation prior to the feast because it would take him a number of days to get from Galilee down to Jerusalem. So let's hypothesize a week before they're saying, are you going to the Feast uh, of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, you know, next week? And he says, no, I am not going up to this feast. My time has not yet come. Having said this, verse 9, he stayed in Galilee. However, verse 10, after his brothers had left for the feast a day or a few days later, then he went after his brothers. The implication is after his brothers. And therefore, verse 14, chronology for the feast and his itinerary, we don't see him again after Galilee until halfway through the feast. Then he's at the feast. And then we don't see chronology in the feast again until, well, the verse I read earlier in 37, the last and greatest day of the feast. Now, that takes us from a week or so prior to the feast all the way through the feast. He waited until three or four days later, that is, until the middle of the feast, verse 14. Why? 
Why would he wait that late? Well, let me give you one suggestion. I think I'll give you another one later. Probably to avoid the great train of worshipers which was headed from Galilee to Jerusalem. He didn't want to be in the midst of the religious herd. There'd be a whole train of people the few days you know, prior to the feast heading to Jerusalem to this feast. It's like going to, you know, something, a sale at a store or something. If you get there, you know, half hour early, that's when everyone else is there. You have to go about, you know, midway through the day. And, yeah, everything's bought by then, but all the customers are gone as well. So he probably wants to avoid the great train of worshipers, which was headed from Galilee to Jerusalem. And here's an important point. Consequently, he missed many of the initial ceremonies connected to the feast. So if he doesn't get there until day three or four, I'm suggesting right now, if he doesn't get there until day three or four in a seven-day feast, then he's already missed the first two or three days' worth of ceremonies. Why would he have done that? Well, the next sentence. He did not go to the feast as one who kept it or to actively participate, but to teach, verse 14. See, Jesus never needed to go to a feast to offer sacrifice for his sins. He never committed any sins. He didn't need to go and offer up this once a year thanksgiving for God because of their harvest because he was grateful with a pure heart all the time. 365 days a year he had no need of these religious feasts you see a true man a true the true spiritual man has no need of things like that you know God does that because of the weakness of the Jews in the Old Testament well I'll give them one great period where they can come and be thankful and then what are we told in the New Testament well to rejoice in Jesus Christ always Paul said finally my brethren I say to you rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice Amen. so Jesus doesn't need the Feast of Tabernacles he doesn't need Passover for the offering. He doesn't need Day of Atonement. He has no sins. He has no moral blemishes. He has no defects in his life. He doesn't need the feast and the liturgy. So he does not go to participate in the ceremonies, to keep it, to participate actively, but rather to teach. His purpose is to get there after the initial sacrificial ceremonies have been completed and concluded he does not have to go with the great train of religious worshipers, the religious herd going there. He can get there whenever that is over, but the people are still there, and he has an audience whom he may teach. Furthermore, taking the whole context of this event, it is obvious that his brothers, now let's bring them back in. They have been some of the chief players in this whole episode. It is obvious that his brothers were taunting him. Isn't that true? Taunting him. Well, if you're somebody. Remember it said they didn't believe in him. They're not just quoting a proverb saying this is what you appropriately should do. It's a taunt because John ends that little taunt by saying and his brothers did not believe in him. So if we were going to read it, we would read it with sarcasm. Why don't you go up to this feast? Well, no one. You think you're some big hot shot and miracle worker and you've got all these disciples. Well, if you can do all these things, no one will do it in some secret, hidden away, half Gentile place called Galilee, but you'll go to the center of Judaism and of the Jewish nation, Jerusalem, at a time like the Feast of Tabernacles and perform your works there. So I think that we should read into that. It's John's intention that we see this implication that his brothers were taunting him to go up to the feast in a great display of his claims. This would be verses 3 through 5. Now we're going to try to interpret this passage in its immediate context here to come to what we think that it means. His brothers are taunting him. Since you're doing these things, brother of ours, miracle worker, then go show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. They're not believing in him and, and kind of suggesting a proper itinerary for him to further his ministry along. They're not friends of his. They're not accomplices in the ministry of Christ. But they're taunting him. And John tells us, informs us of that in verse 5. Therefore, when we read this statement, I'm not going to the feast, 
when Jesus says, I'm not going to the feast, that has to be read in light of the fact that his brothers were encouraging him to go to the feast. And therefore, since they had a certain meaning in encouraging him to go to the feast, then when he says, I'm not going to the feast, that must be analogous, or there'd be no sense in him saying that. The picture John paints surrounding this taunt is one of total secrecy. Notice verses 1 and 10 through 11. There's secrecy involved. Verse 1, he's hiding in Galilee. The Jews in Judea and Jerusalem are out to kill him. There's secrecy. That's, that's the ethos here. There's secrecy involved. Verse 10, how does he go to the feast? Not publicly, but in secret. Verse 11, at the feast, the Jews are watching for him and asking, where is that man? The motif here is secrecy. Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him, some saying he's a good man. You can, you can picture John meaning all of this in hushed tones here. There's secrecy. In my, where is this man? Some says he's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly. See, secrecy again. No one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. And then John's going to break the secrecy. Now, halfway through the feast, Jesus went into the temple courts and began to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? And he even becomes bolder in verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, he stood and said in a loud voice. See, John is building on something here. It's secrecy. Where is this man? Where is this man? Secrecy involved in the brother's misunderstanding of him. They, they see him as a miracle worker per se carnally. They don't see who he really is and what he really is. So there's secrecy. Although he's right before their eyes, he's lived with them as a brother, half-brother to be sure, but a brother. There's secrecy still involved in their understanding of his mission and of their relationship with him. And, and John's building on that. And where is this man? Everyone's whispering in the crowd. And when Jesus gets there, he secretly goes there. Not out in the open, but he must somehow hide whenever he gets there. Probably not in disguise, but at least hiding when he gets there. But halfway through the feast, you get through the sacrificial essence and ceremony of the feast, halfway through, he starts teaching. People are amazed. And uh, verse 25, I might should add in there. Definitely, we should add in there as well. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, is this the man they're trying to kill? Well, here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? More of John's beautiful irony here. Because remember, later in this chapter, the religious leaders are going to accuse the masses of being ignorant because they don't know the law. And so here we really see their brilliance. Well, why? Here this man is. They're out to kill him, and now he's teaching publicly. Why don't they do something about him? Sometimes the masses have more insight than the scholars. And here's their irony, John's irony through their irony. Probably the people say in irony, have the authorities really concluded that he's a Christ? The lay people would know that would just irritate up one wall and down the other, the authorities, to hear these lay people misinterpreting their lack of taking action against Jesus at the feast. But we know where this man is from, and when the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. Now, that shows their ignorance of the prophecies of the Old Testament, Micah 5, 2 being the most notable of those. So the motif here is just secrecy throughout. I think we have to understand that. And it starts with the picture of his brothers. Finally, the meaning of this verse after, what, an hour and a half tonight? Finally, the meaning of this verse, when Jesus said, I am not going up to this feast, does not mean I'm not going up yet. That's what happens. He didn't go up yet. He went up later. But that's not what he means. He doesn't mean with full intention, I am not going, and then later changes his mind. Thus, this case appropriately fitting itself under our fourth point of clarification he does not mean to contrast this, as does the margin of the New American Bible, with the next feast of Passover and the crucifixion, with going up being a metaphor or figure of speech for crucifixion. This verse, the meaning of this verse, 
must be that Jesus, in saying this, meant that he refused to go up at their request. They were not the authors of his ministry or mission or in the manner they demanded, which was how? As a miracle worker. The meaning of this verse must be that Jesus refused to go up at their request. I think there are two meanings here. He refused to go up at their request. They requested him to go up. And he is one who is under the sovereign ministry of his father from above. And he's not going to listen to earthlies, earthlings tell him when they think that he should do something or go somewhere. So if they say go up to the feast, he purposely does not go up because he is directed by his father's will and mission for him and not by what these earthly brothers of his have to suggest. And perhaps more importantly, this verse means he would not go up in the manner they demanded, i.e. as a miracle worker. make another point, an important point here in a moment. Let's see if we understand this. Go back to something I said about ten moments ago, probably. They ask him to go up to the feast. Whenever he denies going up to the feast, then we have to read his denial of going up to the feast in light of what they meant by their request to go up to the feast. Wouldn't that be fair and would that make sense in this context? All right, when they say go up to the feast, do they just mean literally go to this feast? No. They mean go up to this feast in a certain manner or fashion. And John tells us in verses 3 and 5, by implication, as a miracle worker. That is what they mean when they say go up to the feast. No one who seeks to be a well-known public figure does these things in secret. So go up to the feast and show your great mighty power and your miracles and your signs and wonders and works. Therefore, when he denies that request by saying, I am not going up to this feast, we're not to take that in some crassly, uh, literal fashion that just has reference to his legs and feet walking to the feast, but he's simply denying their request. Their request is to go at this time and go in this manner. And he denies that I shall not go at this time, and when I do, I shall not go in the manner in which you requested of me. I will not go as a miracle worker, but I'll go as a teacher of the Torah, of the law. I'll go as a teacher of God's word and not as a miracle worker. That, I think, is what the basic meaning of the passage is, which rules all of these other things out. It rules out the necessity of yet because we don't have a contradiction here. People like uh, Porphyry who see a contradiction by leaving out the word yet and think, therefore, that we ought to stick it in, that Jesus lied or something, they're reading it too crassly. Literally, they shouldn't be reading it like that. And I guess it's because the verses are juxtaposed that they really have a problem. I'm not going up. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went up also. Just because of the juxtaposition of these verses, I think, probably that's what, of other things maybe, has caused the most problems in this passage. So he simply means I'm not going up at your request. I'm not going up in the manner which you demand of me. I will go up as my father wills it, which is in his timing and according to his fashion, which is that as a teacher of the law, a teacher of eternal truth, and not as a miracle worker, which, according to John 6, just thrilled the people temporarily. Remember, he worked a miracle in John 5 of the feeding of those thousands of people and they come across the lake looking for him, looking for him. And he said, you've come looking for me because you got your bellies filled. You didn't look beyond the literal miracle that I performed to see the, the work and the purpose of my ministry here. All you came for is to get some more food. So he finds it superfluous to go up to the feast and do more miracles and that's going to do no good. You, you might notice for the, for the rest of his ministry, most of the rest of his ministry concentrates on teaching. The miracles aren't going to do any good. He concentrates on teaching and getting the truth of God across to the people. And then I even add another point that may be true. It's not it maybe as certain as these others here. I think that is certain. His brothers want him to go as a miracle worker, and he simply denies that by saying, I'm not going up. He means I don't go in this manner. His brothers probably expected him to keep the feast, 
like all others. That may also be what they meant. Not only go up and do miracles, but if you're going to be a Jew, you claim to be part of the covenant of Israel. Well, you've got to go to the Feast of Tabernacles and have sacrifice offered for sin and, and your sacrifice to God and thanksgiving for the harvest and all this. You can't be a true fellow of the commonwealth of Israel and not go to a feast like this. So in other words, his brothers see him as a mere mortal. They do not see him as God who has no need of sacrifice. I think that's probably hidden here in this passage, that his brothers probably, because of verse 5, his brothers did not believe in him. Well, we don't believe in fellow mortals. We believe only in God. So his brothers think of him as a mere mortal. His brothers probably expected him to keep the feast like all others, which he did not. Purposely, he waits, as we see from verse 14 and from verse 10, 9 and 10. He waits until the third or fourth day, the middle of the feast. Verses 9, 10, and 14. Therefore, this text does not properly fit under the fourth point of clarification, which is a change of behavior, as Meyer suggested. But was studied at this juncture, if you ask, well, why do we look at it here then? Because of popular confusion over the verse. See, it really fits under no, none of our studies because it doesn't even involve itself with truthfulness at all. But because of that word yet, or it not appearing there, the omission of yet, that's what's caused the, the issue of truthfulness to be raised here. So it doesn't even fit passages like 1 Corinthians 16 and 2 Corinthians 1 as we studied last time on Sunday do fit here when Paul changed his itinerary that was a, a legitimate lawful change of plans which we do not include in the subject of lying he told the truth so this text does not properly fit under the fourth point of clarification a change of behavior but was studied at this juncture because of popular confusion over the verse. Now that should give you a really in-depth view of this, of this one little tiny verse all revolving around this word yet. For the continuation but was studied at this juncture because of popular confusion over the verse. Now that should give you a really in-depth view of this, of this one little tiny verse all revolving around this word yet. And so when, and so when some, one of those defenders of the faith says, well, we don't have any problem with lying here because look, he said yet, I go not up yet. And you can meekly tell them they missed the whole point. Whether yet's there or not there is beside the point. It's obvious that he didn't go up yet, that he went up later. But you miss the whole point of the theology of what John is trying to develop here. Sometimes people can become so bogged down over trying to find something that's not there or looking just literally at each word as they work their way along. They fail to take into consideration the age-old principle in studying the scriptures, and that is look at the context. What is John theologically trying to develop here? It's some type of clash between Jesus as the secret man-God, God-man, and Jesus as the publicly revealed God-man, man-God. Some type of, of tension that exists between Jesus and his brothers, their misunderstanding of things, as well as the misunderstanding of the people down in Jerusalem. Now, do you know what that means? Middle of page 36, that means that we are through. Now, I didn't get too big of a response because you're suspicious about that. <laughs> well, rightfully so. <clears throat> we are through with our four points of clarification. We are a long way from being through. I'm sad or happy to say. Uh, we have some other things that we want to look at. But let's do this next of all, and we may not get any past this tonight. Since we're through, we just finished tonight our... Last point of clarification. Let's just list these four points again. Now, I know you have them on your outline, part of the outline that you have already. And the later outline you'll get, you'll see it all on there. But let's list this. And you have it in your notes also. Well, let's list it again just to look at it ourselves. 
Number one, our first point of clarification, because we're not going to cover these points anymore. I have some other things I want to say about truthfulness, but we're not going to be in points of clarification and looking up disputed passages anymore. We're through with that. John 7, 8 is the conclusion. Our first point we entitled, it'll be good for you just to write it and see it again, although probably you could quote the second half if I began it for you. Concerning the extent of what is said. Concerning the extent of what is said. And we had an A under that. A person is not always obligated to tell all the truth. With the emphasis being on all. A person is not always obligated to tell all the truth. You don't have to tell, as Dr. Freeman would always say, but he could never really apply it, though, because he acquitted Abraham, or we condemned him. But as he would say, you don't always have to tell all that you know. That's certainly a biblical principle. You do not always have to tell all that you know. But we have two points of clarification under A. Point one, this is not the same as telling the half-truth. Telling a half-truth and not being obligated necessarily to always tell all the truth are not necessarily the same thing. So point one is the first clarification of, of big letter A. If you're using Roman numeral one and large letter A, then Arabic numeral one. This is not the same as telling the half-truth. And clarification two, this is not the same as giving an evasive answer. An evasive answer that tends toward deceit and deception. But you don't have to always tell all that you know. Now, let me give you a, a good example of what I mean under this point A. And I'll use as an example my brief stay down at Gordon-Conwell at seminary. Scriptures do allow us to tell the part of the truth which is more pertinent to the story or the question at hand. You don't have to go and tell everything. Now, Abraham couldn't tell a part of the story out of fear for his life with that part intending to deceive the people. Well, that would be fitting under our first point. This is not the same as telling the half-truth. But I've got two responses to people depending on their attitude toward my stay at seminary concerning my sojourn at Gordon-Conwell. Now, I would have some critics who would ask me, how long were you down there? And what they want to prove by how long I was or wasn't there was, well, you weren't there long enough really to know what was going on. So if you're critical of seminary and you're critical of that, you didn't stay there long enough to give the people any benefit of the doubt. You didn't stay there long enough to learn anything. So if they asked me how long was I there, I'd say I was there a full semester, a full entire semester. Is that true? Certainly was. I stayed there a full entire semester. Then I may have another group of people who say, Oh, well, everything you know, you learned it in seminary because you went to seminary, and so you got taught all that in seminary. What would I tell them when I tell them how long I stayed in seminary? Oh, just a half a semester. Now, is that true? That is true. I went to classes two months and dropped out. Now, bodily, I stayed on campus, but I only went to just one or two or three classes after that the rest of the time. For another, oh, weeks and weeks, I was there on campus, and I stayed in my room the whole time and studied. So you see, depending on who's asking me that, I might give them a different answer. Both of those are true. I'm trying to emphasize a certain point because they're trying to draw out a certain point in me. And if they want to say, well, you weren't there long enough, I'd say I was there a whole semester, and I was. Whether I was going to class or not, I was in that environment for a whole semester. So I know what was taking place down there. But for someone who said, well, you went to seminary for so many months and years, all of this, you went to seminary, just say, well, you went to seminary, and that's where you learned all of these things you, had know, you know. Well, I would say, no, I was only there a couple of months, because in order to learn all the things there taught, you'd have to go to the classes. Technically, did not go to the classes for a whole semester, but only a half of a semester. So here is one of those cases where it fits under A, a person is not always obligated to tell all of the truth. 
I don't have to give them dates and numbers of days and weeks and months. Depending on what they're after, I may select that portion of the truth that is more pertinent to the story, more pertinent to what I want to say to them. And that happened to be one of my greatest concerns of ever even going to seminary. And I talked this over with my wife many times. I said, because I think that what I know, I already know myself, and it'll only be, you know, expounded upon or duplicated in seminary. But if I ever go and I ever walk out of that place with a degree in my hand, a master's or doctor's degree, that anywhere I ever go after this, anytime anyone ever hears me say anything, maybe besides this church, they'll always impute it to my stay at seminary. Well, he got all that at seminary, which would really not be true. But yet, how could you prove that? Because you went to seminary full time. So, of course, now I'm blessed to not have that problem to deal with. I always wondered, how am I going to deal with that? Because I didn't like the way that it looked to think that others to think that everything I know I learned in seminary. Because I didn't. I learned it before I went there. And then helped teach some others once I got down there. But if you ever walk away with a degree, see, you're, you're stuck. You're caught right away. You can try to explain it, but no one will believe you unless it was someone, you know, here in the body. But no one outside would. So, so you got two things in you're fighting against if you want to be known by anybody out there. And I don't care about that at all. But you, if you want to be known, well, it looks good to have a degree. But then it also looks good to know a whole lot of things and not have a degree because that proves that you were taught at home by yourself or taught somewhere like that in self-study. So I chose the latter of those. Anyway, that would be a case that would fit here. B, letter B under our first Roman numeral. We're still under concerning the extent of what is said. A person may not need tell any of the truth. Capital A-N-Y. First time, the emphasis was on all the truth. You don't have to tell all. You can tell part of it. B, a person may not need tell any of the truth. Just don't answer. You can be certain you won't lie then. Just don't answer. Numeral two, concerning actions which are taken. Most people think of lying only insofar as one speaks or tells a lie. But one can lie indeed as well. So concerning actions which are taken. A, misrepresentation. And B, pretension. Here's how we've divided these things up. A, misrepresentation. And B, pretension. In Roman numeral three, certain peculiar, and you want to finish it? Dramatic forms of acting, writing, and speaking are exempt from any problems of duplicity. Certain peculiar and dramatic forms of acting, writing, and speaking are exempt, emphasis on the word exempt, from any problems of duplicity. Thus, Christ in a parable can call the mustard seed the smallest seed, when in fact it's not. The orchid seed is smaller. Thus, scripture writers can use terms like always and forever or any or everyone and simply be using hyperbole. Not exaggeration in a, in a sinful, erroneous manner, but just hyperbole, a certain form of speech or writing that's accepted in writing. We use this, I remember whenever we did some earlier teaching on the Jesus died spiritually heresy. They want to make a big deal about you know the plural deaths in the Hebrew in, in Isaiah 53. And I remember making the point, well, haven't we often used the saying, well, that I died a thousand deaths? And we don't mean that literally. That's just hyperbole. And that's, that's not a lie. It's a, a, a figure of speech, hyperbole. I died a thousand deaths. Or a cat has nine lives. We don't literally mean it has nine lives. But they can get out of the most difficult situations, you know, with a scrape on their tail, and they just seem to keep on living. Cats are quick, you know, so they've got nine lives. They appear to live and live. So certain peculiar and dramatic forms of acting, writing, and speaking are exempt from any problems of duplicity. Let's deal with something I mentioned earlier as an example from Helmut Felix's theology 
a German theologian. I never really came back and answered. I'm, I'm assuming you have the answer by now because it would fit under point three. For instance, if you're writing to someone you hate who's a scoundrel, could you address their letter, Dear John? Yes, that's just an accepted form of writing. You don't mean anything by dear. Whenever I sign dear, I generally don't mean anything by it. It's just become an accepted form of writing. So he, just dear, you do not mean anything by that. When I sign something, whenever you say goodbye to someone, now that really means God be with you. Goodbye means God be with you. Do you consciously and really mean that whenever you say goodbye to someone? No. It just becomes a certain peculiar form of speech that is accepted in the English language, that is accepted in English writing. I wouldn't start my letter, scoundrel John, you <laughs> blasphemer and heretic. That letter won't get any further. His eyes won't get any further. Now, sometimes I might write, address a letter in the salutation, dearest. Generally, you mean something because you've thought beyond just, well, dear Bob, dear Bill, dear John, when you say dearest. Well, you probably mean something by that. But I don't think any of us mean anything by dear. I write a company and say, dear sirs. They're really not dear to me. I don't even know them. I guess if you want to just be totally, you know, logical and just totally consistent and totally woody, you could just say sirs. Or for, to whom it may concern. Or to you men that I don't know. And so I don't want to lie by calling you dear. I'm just going <laughs> to... Address my letters, dear. Whenever I say sincerely at the bottom, you see what we're saying? That's why I fit it under this case here. I don't I'm not necessarily sincere in, in that emotional sense of sincere when I end a letter. But I, I feel perfectly within my right just to say sincerely, to sign it sincerely. That's just an accepted form, or say respectfully yours. Just, a, just a, an accepted form of American writing. Now, if I say, um, you know, most lovingly yours, well, I probably mean that. I'm not going to say that to some head of a corporation that I don't know, most lovingly yours, my dearest one. Or, um, you know, something that's really emotional. I probably mean that. If it's anything beyond the cordially, respectfully, sincerely yours, or the dear John or dear Mary, if, if it's anything beyond that, you've probably gone beyond accepted forms of American writing. That's just the standard way of, of a salutation and a conclusion to a letter because you put some thought into what you're saying. So I don't find any problem with signing a, a letter, you know, um, cordially yours, when I'm not necessarily cordial to them because I don't even know them. So how can I be cordial to them? And by starting a letter by dear John. Okay, so I would fit that here under this third point. I don't mean anything about it. I'm not trying to lie. I'm not trying to think of anything. It's just before you even think, you write, dear John. So how can I be intending a lie by that? Okay, fourth point then, which is our last one that we've been discussing. Truth is compatible with a change of intention, behavior, or action. Truth is compatible with a change of, a t of intention, behavior, or action. Now, I'll give you a very recent example of this one. Someone who left the church, he or she, it doesn't matter. I'll just say he generically, but so you won't know who I'm talking about. But let's say he, whenever he left, he wrote me a letter, and I wrote him back could be she now remember so just generically he and I said that I continue writing him or her well then the next letter I got from them was a nasty critical letter of me and you and the church and everything well I don't keep a big file of letters like that I empty my wastebasket very regularly <laughs> by the day as a matter of fact if you call it that little implication and so, obviously, whenever I first told this person I will continue to write, that, that doesn't bind me forever, that if he calls my mother a blasphemer and says that she wears army boots, that I'm going to keep writing him or her, though. <laughs> Something that he does or says may change what I originally said, and sure enough, it did. Now, I didn't respond to that letter. I looked at that letter and didn't respond. Well, then I hear from someone else, oh, now, now Chino's a liar. You know, he was this, and now he's a liar. Because he said that he would write me, and he never did write me back. Well, what does he expect out of me? Don't we have, isn't that within our right to change our mind if circumstances change? I expected that there would be some type of cordial relationship between us, and I would keep writing him. 
But when I get a critical letter, then I exercise my judicial right to change my mind, to file that letter away somewhere and to not write the person back. So they also didn't stay long enough for our fourth point in ethics, that truth is compatible with change. See, when I first said I'll continue to write you, that was my full intention. I wasn't lying. That was my full intention. They, he, she, changed my behavior with their critical letter. I don't think I lied to them then. I think I have the right now to suspend my writing ministry to that individual. Let's stop. Praise the Lord. Have a good understanding of these clarifications now? Anytime you come up with a situation in your life, get those four points out and see where it fits. You can tell right away from looking at those four points how you fare on God's scale. Well, I said I wasn't going to tell you, but then I went on and essentially told you that probably chiefly it refers to just his visit to the Feast of Tabernacles. He just says, my time is not yet. Certain people want to make that phrase always refer to crucifixion in John's Gospel, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I think John 2, 4 is a definite exception to that rule, and that John 7, 8 is probably an exception to that rule, and maybe 7, 6 as well. And he said that my time is not yet come. Okay, let's stand up and worship the Lord then. If you're wondering what else can we discuss in truthfulness, there are still many concluding things that we want to discuss. And we are going to do a detailed once and for all study on the oath in the New Testament as well. We want to thoroughly research that matter. And I don't know how long that's going to take, but that'll take a little while to study the oath as well. I wasn't planning on doing that, but about two weeks ago, or yeah, two weeks, no, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, it's, maybe it's been, I decided to incorporate that into our study as well because I, I just am increasingly running across all of these writers who say that well the judicial oath and this type of oath and that type of oath are allowed in scripture and so we want to look in those passages and see now is Jesus using hyperbole when he said don't swear at all when James says don't swear by any oath maybe that's just hyperbole that he doesn't really mean every oath or any oath but certain types of oaths he's forbidding in our life See, that's what they are. Well, maybe this is just hyperbole or something. We want to discuss that, see what type of answer we're going to come up with on that. Praise the Lord. What do you have for us tonight, brother? A new commandment I give.